fifth reading of Parshas told us kind of divides into three sections. It opens with the conclusion of Yitzchak's negotiations with his local detractors, Avimelech and his ilk. And in the end, Yitzchak continues digging wells successfully, and he founds the city which we call Be'er Sheva until this very day. And the lion's share of the fifth reading talks about the blessings of Yitzchak. Yitzchak bestowing the responsibility and the privilege of founding a Jewish nation onto the next generation. And Yitzchak has his ideas and Rivka has her ideas and we all know how that ends. Yaakov receives the blessings and the Jewish people thus are fully developed and born in a sense. But there's a curious few verses that kind of intersect between the stories of Yitzchak's negotiations and his continued digging and then the founding of that city of Be'er Sheva and the blessings of Yitzchak. And the, the curious two verses speak about Esau, the elder son of Yitzchak and Rivka, and specifically we speak about his marriage. So he's mentioned in the beginning of the parsha. We hear about him having an unusual complexion. We hear about him being a hairy fellow. Later he shows up to purchase some lentil porridge for the privilege of the firstborn. But in the end, now we hear about Esau getting married. And the Torah doesn't say anything overt about Esau getting married, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, just as a matter of fact. What's going on here? Why do we even hear about this? What is the deeper message for us? And how does it apply in our day and age? So I'm going to try to, to, to explain these few verses, to probe a little bit deeper, and then we'll see how this actually is extremely relevant in our time, in our day. In chapter 27, in verse 34, the Torah interjects a look at the story, in between two stories. I want to tell you that the chapters of the Bible, the chapters of the Chumash, are not of a Jewish source. They come from people who worked for the Gutenberg Press. They, they read the Bible in English. They didn't really understand the Chumash. They didn't have Rashi to help them. They didn't have the other commentaries. And because of that, they naturally assumed that the story of Isaac's blessings is a new chapter. But it's not, because we have the division of the seven aliyahs that go back to Allah Chalamayi Misinai. It goes back ever since when? And the fact that they're included in a single, bracketed in a single aliyah, tells us that there is a continuation here. The story didn't end. This is part of the story. And, and how is that and why is that? So, less about the Torah and let's learn some Torah. In verse 34, Vayi Esav ben Arboim Shana. So Esau was 40 years old. Vayi kach Isha. And he took a wife. Who is the wife? She sounds very Jewish. In fact, her name means Jewish. Who was, who was his wife? It was Es Yehudit Bas Be'eri. It was Yehudit. Yehudit is the female version of Yehuda. That's the origin of the word Jew. It's very Jewish. He takes this Jewish wife. Sounds like he's turned a new leaf. Esau the wild man. Esau the murderer. Esau the rapist. Oh, now he's Esau the very righteous tzaddik. He's marrying a fine Jewish woman. Her daughter is Yehudit. And she's the daughter of Be'eri. And they're from the, she's a chiti. Okay, she didn't come from Kurdistan. She didn't go back. He didn't go back to Iraq to find the wife with the family of Avram Avinu. But after all, she's Yehudit. And then, just to thicken the pot, he marries another wife. And her name is Basmat. Her name is the Spice Girl. And she is the daughter of Elon. And Elon is also a chiti. So Rashi has some very interesting information for us. The obvious question is, why does this Pasuk begin by identifying Esau's age? <clears throat> really, of what difference does that make? And I should tell you that the Torah does not specify the age of Jacob, of Yaakov, when he gets married, even though he's at an advanced age. He was no youngster. And in fact, Rashi evokes the idea of Yaakov being a little bit older to tell us that Yaakov was anxious to get married 
and to bring children into the world. But the Torah doesn't mention it. And yet, when it comes to Esau, who's a horrible guy, he's ultimately the father, grandfather of Amalek, the progenitor of, of, of Nazis and monsters. The Torah tells us how old he is. Of what relevance is that? So Rashi says that this business of the Torah telling us about Esau's age at marriage. And by the way, why did Esau wait until he was 40 years old? It does not seem that he lived a very puritanical life. We heard about Esau's escapades already. So if he was looking for action, and that's what he was interested in, then why didn't he get married sooner? Why did he wait till he was 40? These are, these are the obvious questions that come to mind. And clearly the fact that he seems to have waited until he was 40 years old to get married is, is meaningful. It has some kind of message for us because the Torah talks about it. The Torah, isn't, that, isn't that earlier than his uh, brother? And his, uh, it's far father. earlier than his brother, but it's exactly the age his of his father. This is, will be, that will be a piece of the puzzle. So Rashi says, Esav, Esav was Hayanim Shalachazer. Esav is metaphorized in the scripture as the pig, a hog. And why is that? Well, when David Melech speaks of the hog, he says the following, Shanemar, as it's written in the 80th Psalm, in the 14th verse, it says, Yechar menu chazir miyar. The chazir is kind of, um, eats his way through the, through the vineyard and uh, out in the thicket. And this uh, is understood to be a metaphor for a Amalek who comes from the progeny of Esau. So he's the pig who eats his way or cuts his way through the thicket. What's going on over here? A pig cutting his way through the thicket. How did that become a Amalek? How did that become Esau? Of what relevance is this? So Rashi explains. He says, Hachazir hazer. This, this pig, Kishu Shaykhov, when he lies out, Poshet Tlofov, the nature of the pig is he extends his paws forward. And he kind of displays his paws. Lomar, as if to say, Ru'u Shani Tahar, look at my signs of purity. There are two signs of purity for a kosher animal cloven hooves and rumination, chewing the cud. So the pig displays his cloven hooves, more so than any other animal. It's a natural thing. That's the way the pig lies or crouches. He's always displaying his hooves, always displays his paws. And, and it's as almost as if the pig, the pig actually doesn't know what he's doing, it's instinct. But it's as if the pig, by pose, by, by natural, reverting to its natural uh, position, as if the pig is broadcasting and emphasizing and highlighting his signs of purity. So kach, so is also elu alufi esav. These are the leaders of the family of esav. That what are they? Geislin, the chaimsin. They're people of higher morality, robbing, stealing, umara matzimam kshedim. But they love to display themselves as being kosher, meaning suitable for morality. Obviously, Rashi is talking in riddles here. So now he explains. He says, All 40 years. Now, obviously, it can't be all 40 years. I'm sure he wasn't doing this at three months old. But it's a euphemism. It means during the course of his very viral youth, Esav was ravishing, seducting and ravishing women, married women, by the way, on a regular basis. From underneath the noses of their husbands. He would abuse them. Kishahoya ben Mem, when he turned 40, Omar, he righteously said, Oh, Abba ben Mem Shana Nasa Isha. My father got married at the age of 40. Afani Cain. I too will get married at the age of 40. In other words, do you know why the Torah tells us that Esau was 40 years old? <coughs> because that was part of the narrative. He so waited until he was 40 years old. In other words, he was seducing married women and ravishing them over the course of the preceding 25 years. Obviously, not from the age of, of, of uh, five months old, but from the age of 15 when he committed his first murder, that's when his career of rape and abuse began. And Esau, 
during these 25 years in flagrant disregard of his father's morals did everything wrong with impunity. <coughs> but the, he, Esau did not consider this to be hypocritical. He said, that's, you know, that's, that's what I did. And now, for points, now we're going to behave. And I'll wait till I'm 40, and I'll do exactly as my father did. So in other words, Esau camouflaged his evil, even fooling himself to some degree. Who were these women? Well, one is named Yehuda. It sounds very Jewish, right? Now, the name Yehuda, or Yehudit means, comes from the term Hoda'a, which means to bow one's head in submission, in, in paying homage to God. Now, in fact, this woman was a terrible idolater. We know this. We're going to find this out in a moment. So why did he name her Yehudit? As if to say she has renounced any kind of allegiance to idolatry. Are you saying it's something or very... Well, Asaph named her this. Asaph yes, actually cha Asaph changed her name. Oh, really? So it's and he did this in order to trick Yitzchak into thinking that she was, in fact, a righteous woman. So this wasn't really her name. This was the Jewish name he gave her. As the expression goes, a pig by a, any other name is still a pig. It doesn't change. Did she pretend to go along with this? No, he pretend that she's a mom. Asaph was the perfect pretender. He made believe that he was righteous. He did all these things that were wrong, but he said, I have to be married at 40. I have, I have to replicate my father's behavior. He got married at 40. I will get married at 40. But the reality was that Esav lived his life in total disregard of those very moral standards that Yitzchak lived by. And in order to continue to advance the, 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 the falsehood, the fake news that he was broadcasting, he managed to change the name of the woman. And he also called her, call her Be'eri. Be'eri comes from the Hebrew word. This should be familiar. Be'er. Be'er means a well. As if to say, my well. So he called her Yehudit Bas Be'eri. He changed her father's name too. As if, as if the family acknowledges Yitzchak saying, yes, it's my well. So he gave her these very Jewish sounding names. She doesn't acknowledge idolatry. They acknowledge Yitzchak's efforts and they appreciate everything he's done to dig wells. And now, I have a nice Jewish woman, I'm going to bring her into the home. How do we know that he gave the names? How do we know? Very good. So, so we'll, see, we'll, see, we'll see, we'll see you later on, actually, in Rashi. Not here, but later on, we're going to hear about different names that the Torah gives, and there's a juxtaposition, and we have to figure out <coughs> which is up and which is down. So that's, this, that, that's, like, that's what tips us off. Now, the second wife that he took was called Basmat. Why did he name his wife the Spice Girl? So it has nothing to do with a rock band in England, mm -hmm. but it has to do with because really and truly she used to bring incense offerings to the idols. But Esau, Esau simply lied to his father, didn't bother changing his name. She was known as the Spice Girl because she would bring the spices to idolatry. But Esau said her behavior is so moral and so high-minded that she's considered to be a source of spiritual aroma. And that's how he simply, he made it as if her deeds were morally pleasing, like the fragrance of the spice, which is physically pleasing. That's the way he presented his wife to his parents. Did it work? Did Yitzchak and Rivka fall for it? Well, verse 35 tells us that in fact they did not. Vatihiena meiras ruach liyitzchak ulirivka. These wives were a source of great angst towards Yitzchak and to Rivka. Let's take a look in, in Rashi. And we'll see that Rashi says, Moras Ruach, according to Rashi, is Lashon Hamroas Ruach. And this means the notion of the denial, the, 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 a rebellion against or going in the opposite direction of Ruach. What is Ruach? Ruach means, really means spirit. Do you ever hear of Nachas? Something we don't want to hear about, something we want to actually have. Nachas is to have a sense of satisfaction for the behavior of our children. It's called having nachas from children. But really, if you look at the full term in Hebrew or in Yiddish, it's not nachas, but it's nachas ruach, a pleasing of spirit, meaning that our consciousness is stirred and elevated and inspired by the, the goodness that we see unfolding from our progeny. So the notion of nachas ruach is when it's pleasing, soothing to the soul or to the spirit. And this was Moiras Ruach. It's the opposite of Nachas. 
having nachas, nachat, the term nachas comes from the term menucha, which means rest, to feel good about, your spirit is soothed, and here it was the opposite, this enraged the spirit. It's made them feel terrible, the opposite of a good feeling. Rashi says, Kemoi, mamrim hayisim, this comes from the term rebelliousness. You were rebellious. The word mamrim, Moshe Rabbeinu rebukes the Jewish people in the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy telling us we were rebellious. And he says, Kol ma'asehem, everything these women did, hayu lahachis uli'itzavin li'yitzchak ulirivka, was done in spite and to spite Yitzchak and Rivka. It was done to get under the nails. These were the daughter-in-laws from hell. They literally made Yitzchak and Rivka sick. And why was this? Why was this? Because they were very overt about their idolatry. Despite the fact that Esau had introduced them as being morally in keeping with Yitzchak and Rivka's teachings, it was anything but the truth. And they were overt about they would openly worship idols. Imagine in the house of Yitzchak and Rivka, idolatry was happening, unfolding by their own daughters-in-law. So that's what the Torah tells us. Torah doesn't tell us much else with regard to the notion of Meiras Ruach. So we have Rashi's interpretation, Hamroas Ruach. Ruach Unkula says they enraged or made Yitzchak and Rivka feel terrible. The Ibn Ezra emphasizes that there's an expression that comes from the word morakelana, bitter, as an herb, as a root. And so he says that this is miridas nefesh, bitterness. Not rebelliousness, but it means bitterness, bitterness of soul, bitterness of spirit. And the Rebbeinu B'chaya explains, he says, when a, person, when a person does well in life, or in general, a person's desires a person's consciousness, a person's attitudes, your persona, your, your non-physical being is called ruach. And he says, that's the part, the side of us, our personality. That's, that's like the non-corporeal part of who we are. And that can either be uplifted or it could be assaulted. So Yitzchak's weren't, and Rivka weren't physically assaulted. They weren't harmed physically. But their conscience, their consciousness, their, their sense of spirit, their persona, the, the way they felt about life was, was terrible. And this is because of the behavior of Esau's wife, wives. And then the Torah talks to us immediately afterwards about Yitzchak's blessings, but first we hear about Yitzchak going blind. And there's many reasons why we hear about this notion of Yitzchak going blind. Rashi tells us he went blind because his eyes were so sensitive to things which were unholy. And when they would bring this incense, the incense would actually harm Yitzchak's eyes and eventually he stopped seeing as a result of this. <coughs> but of course, it's precisely because Yitzchak could not see that what happens? Blessings. The blessings end up going to Yaakov. Had Yitzchak been able to see, things would have gone very differently. So everything is choreographed. We see who Esau is, but what we also see is how <coughs> Esau fooled his father. The question too is when he sees his, his uh, daughter-in-laws uh, giving incense to idols, how he would give the blessing. This is this is a very good question, Mark. If he sees he, his daughter-in-law is behaving badly, so the thing is this: he gave the blessings to Esau, not to the daughters-in-law, and and he actually believed <coughs> that Esau could still be turned around. He fell for it. He believed Esau's trickery. He believed Esau's deception. He thought he, really he thought he was hoping. Well you know, was like he was optimistic yeah. he was optimistically hopeful, but he actually wanted to believe Esau's deception and he did believe it to some degree. <coughs> he had to have believed it. So Esau presented everything in, in a very righteous way. <coughs> and clearly Yitzchak must have fallen for it. Because had he figured things out, he would never have given him the blessings. He still believed that Esau had tremendous potential, which he did, by the way. And and he felt he had to just get through to him. There was, there was a possibility. There was a huge possibility. I, I think, Rabbi, you've expressed before but that like, Yitzchak didn't feel that Yaakov could really make it in the world because of his nature. Not, yeah, not, not yeah. that uh, he's so righteous, Esau, but at least he had more of a, well, an ability to... It doesn't, have, it doesn't have to be Esau's super righteousness. It has to be Yaakov's inability to, to deal with the real world or right. you know, get swallowed up by it. But Esau had to be somehow 
righteous or, or, or somehow predisposed to righteousness or willing to be righteous, otherwise it could never work. And he actually believed that, yeah, he, he, he saw by and large was doing good things or trying to do good things. So as such, he had potential. And that would be his responsibility to get through to him to turn him around. All right. That's the narrative. That's the story. Let's take a look here on page Shimon Vav. This is a fascinating commentary. Oh, I just want to think, like, in all this time, Rivka never uh, expressed to Yitzhak the, the, the prophecy she received that the younger would, would overtake the older, like that she never divulged that. That's, that's, a, that's an amazing question, Asia. Did Rivka not ever divulge a prophecy? You remember that she didn't speak to her father-in-law, to Avram, when this all went down. In the beginning of the parsha, when she seeks the word of God, who does she go to? She goes to Shane. She goes, she goes to the ans their ancestor, their common ancestor, but she doesn't want Avram Avinu to know about this. Why? Because she thinks it's her fault. Maybe she's unworthy. Something's wrong with her. So she didn't, she didn't, she made sure not to let her husband or her father-in-law know. So maybe she never told him. Maybe she kept it inside. But that also gives us an insight and understanding into how Rivka had such clarity where Yitzchak Kavino did not. That's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing that she actually looked within herself. She knew something was wrong. She thought it was hers. Well, she went and seek spiritual counsel. Yes, and Rivka ultimately is the one who makes the decision, right? She she's the one who decides the future of the people. But let's uh, let's f focus now. You only have a couple of minutes left. Page Shin Mem Vav. It's the twenty sixth entry of Parshas Tovus. So the, Alter, the Rebbe here is going to share with us a teaching from the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe for a period of time, was delivering very short discourses. And they're collected in a book which is called Maimorim, which means a Hasidic discourse, Haktsorim. Short discourses, short insights, mystic, short mystical insights. There's a, there's a Maimor in the Maimorim Haktsorim, where the Alter Rebbe, as Mavar, the Alter Rebbe explains, Sheyeshne hevdel ben birurei v'zichuchei shal Esav al yedei Yaakov le birurei v'zichuchei shal Lavan. Yaakov Avinu, of course, struggles mightily with different people. And he's got to overcome these challenges. And he's got to figure things out. So Yaakov contends with Esau, and Yaakov contends with Lavan. Now Lavan, Hoyeramai, Lavan was a master of deception. Lavan was the ultimate obfuscator. Funny, because Esau seems to have learned his craft somewhere. The Gemara says, Most sons will be similar in the image of the brothers of the sister. The brothers of the wife, pardon me. So who was Rivka's brother? Lovin. Lovin. And Esau? Esau seemed to have Lovin's genes. But Lovin was a Ramai. It says Lovin was a master of deception. Yaakov had to be clever, more clever than Lovin, because Lovin was always one, at one, one step ahead, or so it seemed. He always had a trick. He always had some kind of deception, obfuscation, another story. As we know, with Yaakov and Lovin, his father-in-law is trying to negotiate with him and trying to make his way through that, East, that Lovin put endless obstacles before him. And that's why it took a long time. It wasn't easy. It wasn't over it. Nimshech ha-ma'avek negde zman rav. Yaakov struggles with Lovin for a long time. In fact, 21 years. Esav lo mazais. When Yaakov had to struggle with his brother Esav, heres kavanosi haroya begoli. It says Esav did not play any games. Esav did not hide his hatred for Yaakov. He told him quite clearly, I intend to kill you. Yaakov had confrontation and he resolved things. It was, a ver it was one afternoon. So it took with love in 21 years, Yaakov and Esau come lock horns and in the course of a short amount of time, they moved their own separate ways. And now, based on this, explains why this final exile is taking so darn long. It's... 
It's not normal. This is totally off the charts. The, the exile at the time of the first base of Megiddo, 70 years. Here we are, 1950 years later. It's unbelievable. And, and we're, not, we, we're, not, we're still not there. So ha-golos hu-be'efen sh'arahu nister This golos is characterized by deception, by obfuscation, by lack of clarity. As it says, and this is a statement made by our sages in the Gemara in Masechet Yuma on page 9, they said, quote, Dorot Rishonim, the earlier generations, Shenidgala Avonam, their sins were overt, open, obvious, Nidgala Kitsam. The time, the appointed time of it coming to an end was also very, very obvious and easy to discern. <coughs> However, Dorot Achronim, the later generations, Lo Nidgala Avonam. The source of our issues, our spiritual inequity, is not clear at all. And therefore, Lo Nidgala Kitsam. Therefore, the end is still not in sight. That's what Alter Rebbe says. In other words, Alter Rebbe is telling us that when you have clarity, it's easy to deal with. When you have lack of clarity, then it's much, much more difficult. It takes a long time. When he speaks about clarity here, he's actually not speaking about the source of, our, of the anti-Semitism and the problems of our enemies. He's talking about the problems that we have from within. Once upon a time, they knew what they did wrong. And because they knew what they did wrong, they could fix it. But when you don't know what's wrong, or it's not clear as to what's wrong, it's very hard to fix. Like if somebody doesn't have their weakness or their illness diagnosed, it's maddening. People can't function, they're not able to live normal lives, and they don't know what's wrong. When you know what's wrong, at least you got a diagnosis, you know what to do with it. So here, the Alter Rebbe seems to be explaining something about the difference between Lavan and Esau, and he says, Lavan was unclear, not forthcoming about what his intentions were. Yaakov had a hard time figuring out what was going on. He had to diagnose the source of the problem and then figure out how to deal with it. Whereas, whereas Esau with Yaakov was very open. He didn't play any games. He told him exactly what he intended to do. He said, I have 400 men armed to the teeth, ISIS monsters, who are coming to kill you and your children. Wipe out Yaakov and his progeny. So Yaakov dealt with it. But Lava never exactly does that. He never launches a full frontal attack. In fact, even when he does launch an attack, he tells Yaakov, you know, you know, it's my children, it's my grandchildren. I mean, I could kill them all, but I still kind of love you. I mean, it's, it's so confusing. So the Alter Rebbe asks a simple question. I mean, the Rebbe asks a simple question on the words of the Alter Rebbe. The Golos we live in today, do you know what it's called? Do you know what the Golos is called? No, no, hurry up, go on. You carry us over you have to stand. What's our Golos called today? The Golos is called Golos Edom. The Golos of? Esau, Rome. The Golos of Esau is the Golos of Rome. That's the Golos we're in today. So Golos Esau, which is the Golos of Rome, if that's the Golos we're in today, that's the Golos that's lasting so long. You say, hey, one second. If Esau is the guy who is so straightforward with Yaakov, if he told him what was wrong in the most overt and obvious way, so for heaven's sake, why is it taking 1950 years for us to end this Golos? L'divri Admur HaZarkin, according to the words of the Alter Rebbe, that when it comes to Esav, it's, look at his split, one, two, three, so then the Golos should also be short. So the Rebbe suggests that there's two Esaus, Esau A and Esau B. There's the Esau as he was with Yaakov. And how is that? Straightforward, overt. I hate you, I want to kill you. But then there's the second persona of Esau. And that's the Esau as he was with Yitzchak, his father. Over there he was not honest. Over there he was not straightforward. Over here he told stories and he spun a web. When Esau dealt with Jacob, he never hid anything. He told him, I'm going in an open war against you. And therefore Yaakov was able to overcome that. When he dealt with Yitzchak, not only was Esav a master of deception, but he did it in the worst kind of way. He was even wiser than Lovan. Lovan never actually got up and said, I'm righteous. Lovan said, let's negotiate. I'm a tough negotiator. You know I'm going to get a better deal. He's also he's actually a liar and a cheater. 
But he, he, never, he never said overtly, he never masqueraded as being a tzaddik. He masqueraded as being an honest businessman, or at least a tough businessman. He, Esau came along and he said, I'm a tzaddik. Yaakov got married at 40, I get married. Esau gets married, I get married at 40. My wife? Are you kidding? She's the most Jewish girl in the country. Her name is Jewish. She's Yehudit. She's, her father is a supporter of, of Yitzchak. He's, she, he's Be'eri. And the other girl, what are you talking? She is the Besamim. She's straight out of the Havdalah kit. She's this righteous woman. She's, she does everything good. He tried to show himself. The Chazer. He's showing everybody his, his cloven hooves, telling everybody how kosher he is. Ah, and this helps us now understand what's going on here. And that's what the Torah talks about. It. The Torah wants us to know that Esau has two sides. Esau has two very different personas. There's the persona of overt hate, and that's one challenge we have. And then there's the other Esau, the Esau who masquerades. And I would like to tell you that in my humble opinion, we're seeing this now. We saw the Esau, we saw the Nazis. They were very clear what they wanted. Even they try to deceive the rest of the world. And then we have the new reality today, the new anti-Semitism, from the Jeremy Cobrans to, to, to the BDS people. And they tell you, we're not anti-Semites. We just hate Israel. We're just worried about the injustice of the Palestinians. We're just worried about the children who are suffering. We don't hate Jews. In fact, we even have a few Jews who actually support us. Never mind that the Jews are off the walls and totally misguided. And therefore, which is the most dangerous of all? The most seditious? Your friends. It's your friends who make believe. They say we don't hate you, but are actually rotten to the core. They are even more dangerous than the overt anti-Semites. And so the stories of Yitzchak and Rivka and the stories of Esau from thousands of years ago are as relevant today as computer science. This is the challenge we're dealing with. And the Abish Tezal Helfen that we should finally get past this challenge. 1950 years is long enough. And we should be Zoycha to finish the Golos of Edom with the coming of Mashiach speedily and in our days. Amen. Amen. So I always thought it was